I'm very surprised that I've had these experiences in certain movies that have really been impactful in some way, often surprising, you know, even Hocus Pocus and, you know, L.A. Story or Ed Wood, Mars Attacks, you know, Sex and City. These are all things that um, they've been resonant with people for many years. I feel that's an unusual experience to have more than one of those, and, and I feel lucky. Hocus Pocus. I've only seen it once. <laughs> I saw the premiere when it, the week before it opened, I guess there was a premiere in Los Angeles, and that's the only time I've seen it. So I, I'm often like not able to answer a lot of questions. I mean, I just, obviously we just, there's a big anniversary right now, so, so I did an interview and I, I've been reminded of some stuff, but mostly I only see something one time. It's preferable for me. I, it's not pleasant for me to watch myself. When you're watching, at least I find myself in a movie, I feel like I'm paying attention to things that I think are less important than, than the story that it's telling. Sometimes you're experiencing the day that you were shooting, but I really do think audiences remember much more about it than I do. Um, I remember more the experience of shooting it than I do the story. Like, I'm not entirely sure I could tell you the main characters' names, the children's characters' names. But the process of shooting was very long. It was an unusually long shooting schedule because I think of the special effects. And actually, a bunch of people got sick, so we shut down for a while. Somebody said to me, well, were you surprised it wasn't a bigger hit? And I was like, I had no idea. I thought it, I thought it was. And I remember specifically the weekend it, it, that it opened. Uh, I was in Los Angeles still, I guess, because I was out there doing press. And the phone rang very early on a Saturday morning, I think. And it was Jeffrey Katzenberg, like, screaming like we made nine million like so my experience was that it was a, it was a great success um, well it certainly made its money back LA story I got a call from my agent and um, there was a casting director in Los Angeles I think her name was Mindy Marin and she was casting the, this new Steve Martin movie that he'd written and uh, I love S Steve Martin and you know knew a huge amount about his work and 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 very particular things about the way he worked and so I loved him and and I you know very much you know wanted wanted the part but it seemed like a real long shot to me and uh, for some reason I I understood her I understood or I thought I understood what I sort of assumed Steve Martin imagined as he wrote this part and um, I enjoyed myself it wasn't an audition where I was really nervous, which, you know, one can be. <laughs> um, and then I just kept getting called back and I did a screen test with Steve Martin, um, which was really fun and, you know, terrifying also. Like, um, but uh, yeah, then I got the part and, and um, got, to, got to play it. Sandy uh, in LA Story is, um, you know, she has like no definition really. She's sort of this sort of floating, ever-changing this person who's so, soaking up other ideas of of a definition or an identity and um, you know she's foolish and silly and doesn't seem terribly bright I mean she's probably brighter than she lets on but for some reason I think think she has to maybe she's more attractive if she's not s smart some memories on movies become sort of mushy you know you're you remember an experience rather than specificity, but I, yeah, I remember vividly many scenes. In particular, I think from the beginning, I had this idea that she would be moving all the time. That wasn't really written so much in the script or the bouncing. There was sp specific movement that was like almost like written as stage direction and almost like choreography, but there was others that I just started doing and eventually the, the director, Mick Jackson, who I loved, and I had, you know, he had done all these, he had done great films in, in the UK and in London. He would eventually just get to the point where he just had a megaphone. He'd say, and bounce, and action. Like, he would just get, tell me to bounce around. Um, but, yeah, I, I sort of remember all the scenes, and, and, and time off camera as well, you know, sitting, waiting, 
you know, kind of staring at Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I guess for some people it's, it feels a little bit like, like it's a little bit, you know, an amber. It was a very specific time in a way of observing the larger sort of ideas about Los Angeles. I'll have a decaf coffee. I'll have a decaf espresso. I'll have a double decaf cappuccino. Do you have any decaffeinated coffee ice cream? Morris? I'll have a half double decaffeinated yeah. half cap with a twist of lemon. I'll have a twist of lemon. My guess is that they'd be still really accurate. Honeymoon in Vegas. I think I got the part in Honeymoon in Vegas because of L.A. Story. And that's what Andy Bergman told me when I, when I met him. I, I didn't even audition for Honeymoon in Vegas. They just offered me the part, which I really couldn't believe. I couldn't believe. I'd never been offered a part, especially a lead in a movie and like a real major motion picture, you know? And um, she wasn't similar at all to Sandy, which is what's, what surprised me about, you know, being cast based on L.A. story, but uh, Betsy in, in Honeymoon of Vegas is really bright. She's a school teacher, you know, she's um, a professional person and shows up every day and is, in fact, um, you know, very uh, conventional, which is the opposite of Sandy, you know, who defies all convention and doesn't believe in any conventions, period. Betsy is like a teacher who, who, who believes in kind of rules and like a model for living, um, but funny because she's written by Andy Bergman, who's, you know, one of great, great comedy screenwriters. You brought me to Las Vegas and you turned me into a hooker, Jack! I read with all the men. There were many, uh, many auditions and screen tests, and it was very apparent to everybody the minute that Nick came in I mean, there was just nothing more to be said and nobody else to meet. Working with him was fantastic. I mean, it was truly great and inspired and fun and, um, you know, surprising, very, very surprising. And it just made my job easy in a way. I mean, it's not easy, but it, there was really like the most like perfect example of listening, responding, because he's he's so compelling, you know, uh, opposite. And um, yeah, I, lo I, I mean, I loved him. Working with James Caan was incredible. He has this very kind of amazing thing that I've never seen in another actor's eyes in my entire life. And I've stare stared across and looked in the eyes of a lot of actors and especially male actors. His eyes actually flicker. It's a very, I've not seen anybody else's eyes actually spark. They sort of have flashes in them that is, it's really something. And it can be both terrifying and, you know, seductive. But um, when it's terrifying, it's, it's really quite something. Edward. Tim just, you know, had been pondering this making this, you know, telling this story for a very long time, and he just had, like, a wealth of stuff for me to read and look at, and that was really important. But then there comes a point where um, you're just trying to be real, given, you know, given your script and, like, the scenes that I had to play. I think the harder part is just I really wanted to mimic those scenes that we were recreating, which was an amazing experience. Like, we were really, like, within, like, the scale, like everything. And um, to me, that was the most, that's the thing I wanted to be most authentic about. The rest of it, you can't quite do when you're playing somebody real. You don't want to, you know, then you get too caught up in um, things that you have no control over. But the recreation of those scenes was hugely exciting and, 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 and like fun to sort out and get right. And I listened over and over again and watched that, those clips over and over again. Um, I think they're they're pretty they're pretty close, you know. Working for Tim Burton, um, and that was the first time I did another movie with him. Shortly after that, and uh, you know, he's just absolutely fantastic to work for because he's so clear, it's so specific. You know, every frame is you understand so so well what he wants. Um, uh, I think his specificity is enormously helpful. You're like really fitting into like a painting that he's kind of already created and um, I like that. I love working with Johnny Depp. I thought he was 
really sweet and uh, great to work with. Uh, great on the set to everybody, um, human, deeply human, and um, you know, just loved his work. He loved his work. He loved being an actor and. And Martin Landau played Bella Lugosi, and he won an Oscar. It was thrilling and so deserved. I mean, he'd been around for so long and had been, he'd been doing great work for a really long time. And he was a, such a good, kind man, so humble. You know, he was a journeyman. He was just working all the time and so happy to be working when he was. And he's a, he was a great, lovely person. Mars Attacks. Tim Burton just asked if I would do Mars Attack, and um, I said yes. I mean, anybody would have. I mean, when I read the script, I was like, really? All right, you know, sure. I mean, I just think anybody would would want to work with Tim Burton and would want to do, no matter how strange, kind of help him fulfill his vision. You know, I'm not, I wasn't at all familiar with those kinds of movies. I I mean, with the exception of, of familiarizing myself with um, Ed Wood, um, genre and those movies. Um, I didn't really know as much the movies that he was sort of kind of recreating in a way. Um, you do, you kind of do what you're told in a way that I really like, you know. There's always a really strong costume designer who's, you know, whose point of view is like playing a really pivotal part in what an audience is experiencing and the hair and makeup department's always really strong. I mean, there's all these other creative influences that are helping you so much. Um, yeah, I turned into, I, was it her dog? I think it was her dog. Natalie, is that you? Yeah. How are you feeling? Pierce Brosnan was involved in that. Was he a, like a, my, a wild, like a crazy scientist, like a mad scientist? Something like that. Yeah, something like that, yeah. <laughs> The family stuff. I love that part, and once again, that was a, the kind of part I, you know, I'd never played that before, and I really, I really liked it. I, mean, I was very nervous, in a way, making that movie, not daily on the set, but trying to figure it out. And Tom Bazooka, who wrote and directed it, Tom was really helpful. Tom was really, uh, he was strict with me in an interesting way. You know, he wanted me to play this part, and but he also wanted pieces of me gone. So it was interesting and I was very happy to, like I didn't feel that he was um, not appreciative of what I have to bring or my own skills, but he wanted something else for me. And and uh, part of that was really scary because it, it was being watched in a way um, I felt. And I was intimidated by Diane Keaton. Even though I had I'd known her, we did, you know, First Wives Club um, years before, but I, this was so intimately, we were in each other's faces so much, and I, you know, I wanted her to like me. <laughs> and, um, but I, I loved that movie. I was really proud of it. I was proud of everybody's work. I was proud of my work. And when I saw it, I, I loved it. I mean, I really loved it. I love Craig T. Nelson. I mean, the whole cast is, many people have gone on. Those there were some folks in that movie who were, relatively unknown at the time, not unknown, but you know, Rachel McAdams and Elizabeth Breezer, like these were actresses that were just starting to emerge and um, you know, and I thought Luke Wilson was so great in it and Dermot, like I thought there were such great performances. Sex in the City. That part and that story and that, you know, um, I think they are so daily in my life, like I, in ways that are you know, probably very um, obvious and then ways that aren't, whether it's, you know, people on Instagram or walking down the street of New York or people seeing me or me having a memory of a, you know, cross street where I shot, you know, two dozen or more scenes. Um, So I feel like it's not uh, far away, but the experience is in many ways, and and I feel, for the most part, I feel fine about it. I mean, I had hopes that we would get to make another movie, um, and I was excited. I think because it finally felt right in the story. So I, I mostly feel g- great. Like I love where we got to leave all of them. I think they're all probably doing really well, um, and um, 
still enjoying that friendship and their city, or maybe some have left. Charlotte might have finally moved to the suburbs, my guess is. But it's a, you know, it's a real privilege to have that, not just the memory of the experience, but have the connection with the audience that, that was initially, you know, along with us and discovering us. But today, a whole new generation of young women stopped me, literally, every single day of my life to, to share their feelings and thoughts and affection for this uh, show and the movie. And um, that's, a, that's a privilege you know, and it's a it's a, a a professional blessing, no doubt. It's not so much that I feel Carrie within me. I mean, you know, we would have stretches of time, and then we'd come back to work, and you would sort it out pretty quickly. You'd like rediscover like 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 a muscle or something that is like slightly atrophied on a hiatus, or so you find that stuff very quickly. But it's uh. It's part of you in ways that you can't, um, it's hard to articulate the ways in which it, it sort of, it, it, you know, it, 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 it's in you. It's part of your memories. It's part of your um, most important professional moments and years and time spent. It's, you know, incredibly sentimental and nostalgic. Uh, but the character isn't in me because I, you know, I, I, she's somebody else's creation, really. And I long to play other people and, and other parts. Um, but, I, you know, if asked to, to find her again, I could, I could manage. <laughs> here and now. Well, the character in Here and Now is, uh, her name is Vivienne, and she is um, a singer with relative success in New York. She's had a, a career that she's both, that is both a source of pride and frustration. The movie really is a, a story about a, a a woman who gets a diagnosis, and it's and it's uh, it's a portrait of this next twenty four hours in her life as she absorbs this information, and it's about love and loss, and um, I think coming to terms with um, the role you've played in your own life and the relationships you have with those around you and with and with the city, you know that both. Um, loves and betrays you.